July 30th is UN's World Day Against Human Trafficking, an issue that is far more widespread than you may realize. I spoke with Tim Ballard of Operation Underground Railroad about his mission to end child sex slavery. Though it was an extremely challenging conversation, it is very important and it hits especially close to home for me. Now, I would never compare my experience to what these kids go through, but I was sexually abused as a young kid and it took me several years to start to heal. And I feel deeply for any kid who's ever been taken advantage of. Now, some of you might find this information disturbing, but hearing this can make such a difference. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. Welcome back everyone to the School of Greatness. Super pumped today for my guest, Tim Ballard in the house, my man. Good Thanks to see you, brother. Me. Thanks for having me, man. So, great, so grateful you're here. I first learned about you, I think, about a year ago. Someone was telling me about you, but then I really learned about you when Tony Robbins' 60th birthday party, where I watched the videos, got to hear you speak, and got to see the work you do with Operation Underground Railroad. And it's amazing what you have done. It's amazing what your organization have done Thank you. in really helping end childhood sex trafficking. Yeah. And I'm curious if you can help educate my audience who maybe has no clue about this. Like, I didn't have a clue about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. What, what is sex trafficking in terms of the U.S.? Is it actually happening? And what is it in terms of international? What is the problem at hand right now? Yeah, so this is not a peripheral issue. Most people want to believe it is. This is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. Really? It's, more than it, drugs, it, more than... It's the fastest growing, really. It's, really? it's, it's rivaling drugs right now. Because you can sell oh, it's it. It's the fastest growing. Gotcha. Fastest growing. But in terms of the numbers, it's actually getting up to drug trafficking. And the reason is you can sell a bag of cocaine one time. But you can sell a child. Oh, my gosh. You know, 10, 20 times in a 24-hour period. So it's very lucrative. Uh, and it's, it's enormous. It's a huge business. Now there's... So it's a renewable product. I mean, exactly. You can recycle the product. That's right. I don't want to say it like that term. But, but that's how they that's see how, it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, wow. So there, you really start with the bigger issue there is, is modern day slavery. That's what this is. People not controlling their persons, right? Their own body, their own, their own lives. And there's about 30 million estimated slaves in the world today and about 10 million of those are children. And then they're sold for different things. About 2 million children are forced into commercial sex trade. The rest are slave labor or even really? organ harvesting. Really? Or and so we work it. That's, and so, so how many in the, the category of sex slavery? How many? They, they estimate there's, that there's 2 million, this is State Department, UN, 2 million children. But my experience tells me, because we, we're in 26 countries, we're undercover, we've been everywhere. And if you're, if you're in slave labor, it's just a matter of time before they use you for, sex. for sex as well. Wow. It's interchangeable. I mean, slavery is... So it's how can we make money from right, a person? Right, yeah. Once yeah. you own someone, you think you own them like a, like a, a product, an object, you'll do whatever you want with them, right? Wow. So, How is this... Even, I mean, are people, are there slaves in the U.S. right now, or is it mostly international? So, it's a great question. So, when, I, when people ask me about the U.S., because so, I'd rather, because most people in the U.S. would rather just say, it's happening far, far away, and I'm going to just go, like, you yeah, know, I'm yeah. not going to listen to this. And the truth is, we are the number one demand. I'll start with that. In we're, terms of, we, we the buy the States. products the most. Yes, we are the number one consumers of child exploitation <sighs> material. We're just not doing it in the U.S. Well, we're we are. Going, we going, are. So, I'll get there. Yeah, so... So we are the number one consumer, which means we are the market. So yeah, we are we are the sex tourists that we're, that my group and law enforcement are targeting and catching overseas, hurting kids. But recently, what would you say? Eighty percent is U.S. consumption, or is it, it, it like it depends? Like in in the markets, like south of the border in, in Latin America, yeah, wow. yeah. But you but get in it, Asia. It's, going to Asia, it's maybe with like half and half us, and then like the West locals. Of, what, and yeah. Yeah, a lot of locals, they generally make up the most. Of, wow. They generally make up the most of the market of the consuming side. Um, but we just, the United States just became, last year, ranked in the top three for destination countries for trafficking, which for means... other people to come here. Right. The traffickers say, look, that's the market I want in. If I can get into the country, and then, then we're really going to make a lot of money. And so they're trying to get their, their, their slaves into our country. Because, so, so then we won't, so then U.S. people won't have to travel. travel. Right. This is crazy. It man. is crazy. So it they'll is just crazy. import people here. Yes. Kids. Yes. Teenagers. Mm -hmm. And then they're slaves to for, whatever. For they either want. labor or, or sex. And it's not as. Where it, is this? Is this in LA? Is this in. So here, yeah, that's a good question. Because I can go to like a developing country where the infrastructure isn't as great 
and law enforcement struggles, and you can see children being sold on the street corners of this beach, you just gotta know where to go. You're not gonna see that here. Here, it's mostly online. Wow. It's in the dark net. So like our, our warriors out there fighting, fighting it and finding the kids are like the Internet Crimes Against Children task forces, lo local law enforcement, these guys who have the tools to go in and basically infiltrate criminal organizations that are using those platforms to find kids. But I've, for 17 years I've worked as an undercover operator in some capacity and I have bought and sold a child on every single social media no platform that, that's on out social there. social media? Oh yeah, it starts there often. It will start there and then leads to private phone calls and all of a sudden you're negotiating the deal for in person? a child. Yeah. No way. Mm -hmm. How many, so you've been doing this for 17 years now? Mm -hmm. How did you originally get into this? I've heard this story, but I want my audience to hear how you even knew this was a thing and decided to go all in on this. So I, I started in the CIA and I was, I had prepared my entire life to fight terrorism, even before 9-11. I was, um, I was studying, that's what I was studying. In fact, I, I graduated from grad school with a degree, a very unique degree in terrorism. Really? Uh, in 2001. Wow. So the floodgates opened for, for us to go work wherever we wanted. I chose the CIA and I was working at the terrorism desk there. And you were going into terrorism before 9-11. Yes, you already. You didn't know it was gonna be something. Right, big it was like, wow. oh my gosh, here we go. And then one of the terrorists, people will remember this name, Mohammed Alta, who came across the border, um, he, he was staging in Mexico and he crossed the border and went up and, and, and launched those, those attacks on the, on the Twin Towers. And that just, I was at CIA during 9-11. And I was like, I want to be on that border. I speak Spanish, I wanna be on that border to, to fight terrorism and protect the country from there, from that wow. position. So I, w in the wake of 9-11, the creation of Homeland Security. So I was one of the first to jump ship and I jumped over into Homeland Security. I became a special agent, undercover operator, thinking I was gonna be doing terrorism. Work. Where were you stationed then? I was at the Calexico, California port of entry. Right. So I'm, near Tijuana or near? It's near, it's, it's about 100, uh, 100 miles East Inland. of Tijuana, yeah, yeah, yeah gotcha. it's from San Diego, wow. right, right on that border. Well, a lot of people come in because it's probably less of a big city. Yes, it's easy, yeah. exactly. It's, and there's three ports of entry there. It's it's, it's very busy. Wow. And, and lots of criminal activity crossing that Drugs, border. Drugs. Yeah. People. Yeah. Yeah. So we were we were finding tunnels, and it was. Really? I mean, my office is right on the border at the port of entry. I was loving life, but for six months I'm doing this, and they call me in and they said, "Hey, we feel it's time to start a child trafficking unit." Child I said, what is that? I mean, like the rest of the world, like you know, child yeah. trafficking. You could Google trafficking, child trafficking in 2001 and nothing would come up. Like no one was talking about it. So even I was like, I don't even know what that is. I'm, I don't think I want to do that. Yeah. Like that is, I went home and told my wife, she's like, no way. We, we, had, we were just starting a family, had a couple mm -hmm. of kids. She's like, you can't bring that darkness into our, I don't want to know what people are doing to kids, you know? Yeah. And How old are you at this time? I was probably like 25, 26, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I had to go tell my boss, no, I'm not gonna do it. And I was really scared to do it because this guy was intimidating to me. Uh, big, he was six foot four, big yeah, yeah. white hook mustache, wore boots to work, you know, one of those guys. His whole life on the border. And I was not, <laughs> I, just, I didn't want to tell him no. And, but I'm practicing my speech literally in the mirror, right? Like, okay, how am I gonna say this? And my wife walks in to the bathroom and she's crying and she does not get very emotional usually. And I said, what's wrong? She's like, I didn't sleep at all last night. She said, for the same reason I thought we had to say no to this because we have children, that is the reason we need to say yes. Mm -hmm. Because we understand what a childhood is supposed to be. And if it's true, and we weren't even convinced yet, but if it's true that millions are being trafficked this way, how can we allow it to happen and, and do yeah. nothing, right? So, wow. so then I said yes, and I entered it, and it was about- So you're already practicing your speech, yeah. and then you decided, okay, I'm gonna commit to this. And the speech became one word. Yes. Yes. I'm in. Yes. I'll do it. Um, and he put me. He put me. He put me to work, work right away, and dude, it was like a thousand times worse than I could have imagined. Like right away, it was just like. Boom. When was the moment where you saw something that just said, "This is my. I'm taking this on as a life mission, not just as a part of my job." But it was the. It was the first time I saw a child. That was from the videos. When I was like, "This is it." It's, I had to make a decision at that point. So what, what had happened was we got intel, uh, uh, an American man had ki was kidnapping children in Mexico, smuggling them into the United States and in San Bernardino, you can look this, this case up, his name's Earl Buchanan. You can look it up, you can Google, learn all about the case. He had a compound up in San Bernardino where he was taking the kids and he was filming his sex no. acts with these kids. He was 
having sex with them yes. and filming and it. And filming it. And then what, selling it online or? Just keeping it for himself, sharing oh with gosh. people. And so this guy's coming across the border and, and um, we're on the scene and we get the kid out, this five-year-old boy. And I, it, it was the moment that he five ran. Five-year-old boy. Five-year-old oh boy. Gosh. And I recognized him from the video. No way. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen one of the kids from the video. And I'm like, I didn't know, my, my, I had a physiological reaction. Like, I didn't know if I could handle this. And then the kid kind of inherently knew we were the good guys, right? So he runs to us and jumps in, our, in my no arms. No way. And he's like, hold it. he's holding me and he's shaking. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, does he speak English? Does he speak Spanish? I, maybe both, I don't know. And he spoke perfect English, which was haunting to me because the only reason he did was because he had been with this guy, as it turned out, since oh. he, was a, he was taken as an infant. Oh my gosh. And he said to me, like no five-year-old should ever have to say to anybody, anyone, he said, I don't belong here. And the pain was so severe for me because I could immediately multiply that statement by millions of kids. And that was it. And then that, that led to raiding the, the compound and we found 11 other kids. No. Yeah. How old range? About f from six to 12. Wow. So that was my point of like, I had to make a decision. I went home after that operation. So the first operation. That was the first time. I did a lot of cases Research, where we did, yeah. we did the um, receiving end. So we did like the search warrants and arrests of pedophiles who were receiving child rape videos. But, but this they was didn't the have kids there. Right. This was the first time I saw one of the kids from the video. And it like changed my life. But the change was either going to be I'm quitting forever or I'm all in. Because I, there was, you can't, it's too much to go one or the other. You can't go middle ground on right, this, right? right? And I went home that night after two or three days, actually. I went home to my wife. She didn't really know what was going on. I walked in the house. And then I see my kids, right? And, oh. I'm, and they're playing and having fun. And this kid was... We literally 12 miles away. I was, I lived 12 miles from the border. This kid, this was happening to this child, and the whole dichotomy of the whole how can we be in the same community and hell here and you know almost paradise here for these children who have every and I just I lost my mind. Like I just I couldn't handle it. I saw my children being hurt. I went to like oh, a man. mental and I literally fell down. Like my le my knees collapsed. I fell down, and my wife thought I was having a heart attack or something. She wow. runs over to me. She's like, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" I'm like, I'm out. I'm out or I'm in. Like, I can't, this is so bad. And it, it was my wife, again, who said, you know, she got me calm and, and she said, look, it's hard. I know the pain, you're clearly suffering something, but how does that compare to what that Ooh, child suffered? Oh my gosh. And I was like, no, you're right, that's it. Yeah, and you're I, not I was experiencing like, it. Yeah, I'm like, how, I felt guilty, like, how stupid. I'm up on my knee, I jumped up, and I'm like, I'm in. I'm in 100%. But the thing that happened, and call this luck, providence, whatever, t to me it was special, is the little boy had a necklace. That little boy, the five-year-old. And he, his sister had given him the necklace w when they were separated by oh, Buchanan. Yeah. Okay? And it was a little dog tag. And, I, it, and he gave it to me. You know, he knew I, mm. I had to go find his sister now. Oh, no. Yeah, and we did. We got her. We got her out. Oh, my God. But he gave me the necklace. And, and I tried to give it back. He's like, no, it's yours. It's yours. This is when he was hugging me. And I'm like, okay, I put it in my pocket, didn't think much of it. But later, one of my children found it and said, would you get this? I'm like, uh, how, do I, how do I tell this story to my kid? And I tell my kid what I can. And he says, isn't it cool that that little kid put your name in the necklace, Dad? I said, what are you talking about? My name's not in the necklace. I'm like, yeah, yeah, your name's right here. And I, sure enough, I flip it around. And that little necklace had a scripture from the Bible on it from the book of First Timothy. Oh, my goodness. So that was like, to me, I was already feeling like, what am I going to do? Am I going to quit am i gonna go full in that necklace it was like I, it was like it was like that little boy whether he knew it or not just gave me a commission and the, and that necklace i wore that for every operation i did from that point on and it was kind of like my symbol like i'm oh, in wow. now so wow and and so you started here locally in the u.s yes and then you started going to different countries right, right? and you started going to South America right. originally, right? Right, because what happened in 2006, the US passed a law called the Adam Walsh Child Protect Act. And what it did was it changed my life. People didn't realize, for us agents, how it did that, but it, st it changed the statutory requirements for sex. We had these sex traveler statutes that said you can't travel to have sex with a child, but you had to prove that the perpetrator had the intent in his heart and in his mind while standing on US soil before he left, which meant before 2006, we had zero prosecutions. So the Adam Walsh Protect Act said no more, 
You don't have to prove he was thinking about it on U.S. soil. All you have to prove now is that he left and he committed the act. Really? And now we will hold him accountable as if he committed it on our soil. Really? So it's this revolutionary law. So now if you go to another country and have and pay to have sex with a child or don't pay and you have sex with a child, yeah. you can still go to jail here. here. And there's That's no double amazing. jeopardy, by the way. You can serve 10 years in Mexico and, and then 20 more years in the U.S. Wow. Yeah. What is the law, I guess, around sex, having sex with a minor or, or paying for sex, are they, are they different laws or how does that work? Every state, there's like, there's, there's different state laws uh -huh. and then there's a federal, there's federal law. So it depends what jurisdiction and sure. it's, I've, it's all over the board really. Yeah. Um, and then internationally, same thing. It's kind of all over, gotcha. which is great to have the safety net in case like the guy only gets two years and in some, in some foreign country, we're like, well, we got you when you get back right. and we're going to, we'll, we'll treat you differently. So, so uh, how much is this happening now in the U S? Oh, it's, in, in it's, 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 it's constant. Really? It's constant. Yeah. It's, you, we, we can't keep up with the demand. Um, it's, we, our, half our operations are domestically. People don't realize that. They think we're only foreign, but we support operations here. We provide canine units that sniff out digital media. You saw some of that at Tony's party, maybe this, the video. How do they sniff out digital media? They're trained just like a drug dog, but they're trained to sniff out like like little thumb drives. Because what happens is perpetrators, pedophiles, they, they hide it. This they hide it, and this is the evidence. I mean, we'll find a child in here that can lead us to where that child actually no is. Way. But these guys are hiding it because they know the cops could come any day. So they they hide it in the carpets, they hide it in the floorboards or whatever, and and the human being will never find it. Well, we have dogs that run to it because they, they're just trained to sniff out the metallic, this whatever is it is. Nuts. Yeah, and they and that's and we nail these guys. So we have, we've deployed a couple dozen of these dogs, right? And we, I, I love it because there's these beautiful animals and and we chart their rescues. Like, the, the Cinnamon Bark is one of our dogs. And he, he and doTERRA is essential oil company uh -huh, actually yeah, paid yeah. for it. Wow. And they say, you can name it. We're gonna name it Cinnamon Bark. That's one of their products, you know? So it's amazing. Um, so Cinnamon Bark's one. We have Spike. We have, and, and they literally have like, Spike has, has saved 10 kids. Cinnamon Bark That's has saved- crazy, It's man. the cool, and you look at these dogs, you're like, I just love you. Oh just, it's just amazing, you know? So. Wow, so when did you, how much longer were you with uh, as a special agent before you left to go start your own foundation? So what happened was after that law passed, um, they put together a group and they basically said, okay guys, and let's enforce this. Go out and find Americans. Who are doing this. Yeah, and they put me on the team and put, sent me to undercover school and said, now go be ten, pretend to be a pedophile or Wait, a trafficker. What's, what's cover school? Undercover school. Or what is that like? Dude, it was insane Tell because <laughs> they sent me to undercover school to teach me how to be a pedophile. No way. How, how to think like one, how to, you know, that's, that's what how I How to talk like it, how to. Right, how to get in. Um, and I get, wow. I get there and they, they, they bring me into a room. It's like a studio, kind of like this, right? There's a two-way mirror and they're going to assess me. Because in the end, it's interesting. They said to us, we can't train any of you guys to be undercover operators. You're just here to, so we can determine if you are one. It's because it's, it's very unique. It's like an acting and you got to be able to, you know, it's, it's tough, you know? So it's an assessment, right? And they have this undercover operator who's like the instructor, but he's like one of the top guys in the US government. He's, a gen he's playing the role of a general smuggler. And so they get, people are coming in, you know, candidates like me are coming in one by one to be tested and, and they give everybody a different legend. Like, okay, you're a drug smuggler, you're a terrorist, you're, mm -hmm. and you've got to get this guy to commit to- To believe in you. To, yeah. yeah. And so I get my turn, he doesn't know what's coming, right? And I sit down with him like this and I start, I mean, I'm just, I'm just tripping all over myself. There's, there's cameras everywhere. I'm like, I suck at this. Like, it's horrible. <laughs> and I've got to bring up kids now. Like, oh, man. so I eventually bring it up, and the guy's just like, and he, he says the words out of roll, which means a cut. And he looks at the guys in the two way, and he's like, What are you doing? He says, are you punking me? Like, I've, I've got a, I, I have a daughter who's a year old. I'm not gonna play. And he, he left. I'm like, What's going on? So the instructor comes in. He's like, Tim, bottom line, like, look. We're, 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 in new, we're in new waters right now, man. Like, we're, we're, we're gonna, we gotta chart this course. So I felt very much alone. So actually what I did was, because there was no real hit, there was no curriculum yet. You were creating it. I, we were creating it. And, and I actually started reading every book on the last time that I could read, we knew that slavery existed. So I'm reading about, that's how Harriet Tubman became my hero. I mean, I'm reading her book, uh, the, her story, Frederick Douglass, Harry Beecher, all the abolitionists. Really? And that, it wasn't a casual decision to call our foundation eventually when I got there, Operation Underground Railroad, because we used the tactics that they used. They were undercover operators. Wow. They were, how they used the media, how they used the politicians. It was like, these were masterminds. They figured it out, and it's like, they're now our inspiration. 
So wow. that's, I, that's the, you know, we, we built the curriculum off of, largely off of that, off those wow. stories. Yeah. So at first they were like, no, you're really bad. But then they're like, <laughs> okay, you got to figure it out because we don't have a curriculum. Yeah, you eventually figured it out. And, and, and then they sent me overseas. And Where did you go? I was mostly, I speak Spanish, so they sent me mostly into Latin America. Uh -huh. I worked in Guatemala and Mexico and Costa Rica and uh, the Caribbean, Colombia. And the problem, th there was an unintended consequence to all this. Because if I couldn't find the American in the, in the time allowed by the budget that was given, like, I had to come home. Like, you got, so there would be intel. They would say, we need you to go to Costa Rica. We've got intel that there's these three guys that live there or that are coming there right now. They're selling with girls, boys. They're buying them, whatever it may be. So you had the intel. You had to go there, find them, figure out where they lived. Exactly. What city they're in. Exactly. And then build rapport with them. That's right. So it wasn't like, we're going to go break down the house and come in. We're going to become friends with them. Oh, yeah. No it's, way. It's, it's, it's. What was this it's like your stomach first time churning, meeting, man. Oh, like, it's stomach churning. meeting this, this? I'm sitting toe to toe with these guys, right? And they'll pull out a cell phone and they'll be like, okay, here's who we got. No. We got five kids. year olds, we got 10 year olds, we got. And I'm looking at the pictures. I'm like, and I've got to pretend. You have to act like you want them. Like, dude, she is. I, I, it's horrible. Like, I, the whole, I'm doing it. Like, up here, I'm smiling and, and my stomach is just like churning. I want to reach across the desk and just destroy this guy. But if I do that, we'll never find the kids. So it's a mental game that like will crush you if you're not like pre pre like constantly preparing and constantly. Wow. Um, how do you, how do you manage energy and body language when you know that in your gut you're against this, but you have to in your mind like trick this person? How do they not get fooled? How do you master persuading them when you're against it? It's just it's just practice and practice. First, they send you as a secondary operator. So you kind of watch. And you're kind of just playing the role of someone who's just kind of watching. And then eventually you get to primary, which wow. I got to eventually. And then it's, you know, so it's just practice. And, and like, it's interesting. I can't really answer that because even the instructors, like I said, they would say, we can't teach you how to do this. Either you, got we're it, just here to tell you if you have it or not. Wow. And, and, and so that's, that's what happened. Do you ever feel like because you have to get in that mindset of a pedophile and, of, uh, you know, someone who's selling or buying kids that that it might ever trick your mind into actually becoming that? Has that ever crossed your mind where like, like how do you keep your mind no. powerful and strong against those yeah. thoughts? Yeah, the answer, no, because, because once you see it, a decent yeah. mind, I, I couldn't even, I wouldn't even burden you with what it is. Yeah. Because you see what this is, the kind of exploitation and the videos that are made of children. You it's would so never be able in your yeah. mind. And so it's a punch to your stomach and it gets worse every time. No way. It gets worse every time. And I mean, it, it, if anything, it, it, it makes you less interested or interested in any kind of sex. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm kind of opening up here, but like in the middle of a case, like I come home, I'm like, I, I, I need to be alone for. Yeah, I can't even like my poor wife, you know, it's like, don't you not, you not love me? Or I'm like, wow. no, I'm just, I can't even, you know. You're like, emotionally like broken. Yes, you're just broken. I mean, it, it breaks you. You have, you have to like detox. I mean, it's horrifying, you know? So what was this like in Costa Rica with this first time then for you? I think you said it was Costa Rica. Yeah. Or maybe I was making that up, but what was that first time for you? Yeah, so so one of the, one of the, the, the probably the most interesting case yeah. that I worked where it kind of, this was the unintended consequence the U.S. government didn't expect or I didn't expect is, so I make myself the bait, right? And I'm, I'm in deep with these guys. I'm their friend, they trust me. We could be weeks or maybe a month or so away from getting the kids and getting to that point. But if I don't find the nexus, the legal nexus, the connection back to the US government, it's come home. But it's like, but if I come home, this whole thing goes belly up. And so that was the thing I would fight wow. until it pushed me too far to the point I was like, then I quit. And it was, it was, it was a case in Colombia and a case in Haiti, both, I was doing it at the same time. And I went too far. I, I went further than I was supposed to go anyway. But I got really deep. And they said, we're the Americans, Tim. Like, we can't sustain this. Washington's going to shut this down anyway. Like, we, it was no one's fault. It's just there's no jurisdiction. Unless there's Americans doing it. Right. You can't go to someone in Colombia if they're doing it. You can't do anything. Right. Right. Because it's I, only U.S. The only jurisdiction I have is a U.S. court. So I've got to find a U.S. person. <laughs> Who's buying kids? A child or, or a perpetrator uh, either who's one. United States. Got it. And so on that Columbia case, I, I, we had hit like a gold mine of trap. Like, I can't call it that, but it's, we, we had hit like the mother load, okay, of, of, of bad guys. And had, how many kids did they have? It was over 100 kids. Wow. It was going to be over 100 kids. 
And and I don't blame my boss at all. He did what he had to do. He's like, you, you got to come home. Because there were no Americans involved. You can't. You, there's nothing I can do. For, he did everything he could to keep it and push it and make it happen. But there came a point where you just couldn't, you couldn't do it. And, and that's when I had to make a decision. And, and I called my wife and I said, what do, what do I do? And she's like, my wife, she's like just very stable and very, like, very inspired, I'll say. Uh-huh. And she just said, well, it's obvious what you do. Do you think you can save kids? I said, I, I'm very confident we'll save over 100 kids. She's like, then you quit your job. That's it. We'll worry about, you do the right thing first and you wait, you know, always do the right. Th- how, can, how can you live with yourself? How, and then she said, how can I live with myself? I mean, there came a point in my wife where, where I was like struggling to, to stay and do, and do this job. And she said, she ended the debate with these words. Um, and these are verbatim because I'll never forget it because it like, it like penetrated my pierced soul. You, pierced yeah. me. And, yeah. She said, I will not let you jeopardize my salvation <laughs> wow. by not doing this. Wow. I said, okay. And so if, if anyone needs to end a debate with your loved one, that, that line works. It's, it's, it's a go. powerful line. Wow. So, you know, so that was it. And I was like, okay, if that's how you feel, then I'm in. And we quit and started Because you're operation. not making millions of dollars. You're making a government salary job. You're... Oh, yeah, I have no savings. Yeah. I have six kids at the time, okay? <laughs> how old are you? I'm probably now late 30s. Yeah. And I have no savings. Yeah, you're, you're spending thousands and of dollars like, on food for kids. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like Catherine, I'm just going to tell you, like, this was like uh, fall, like June, I said, by, or December. I said, by June, we're out of food. Like, I don't know how we're gonna feed the kids. She's like, that doesn't matter. Wow. She's like, how can you live with yourself? There's a wow. hundred. I said, okay, no, you're right. You're right, you're just way braver than me, okay? <laughs> right. You're like, I gotta protect you, I gotta protect the family, I gotta be safe. Oh, it was, it was, a, t- provide. It was a hard, t- several, it was a hard month. It was December of 2013. Oh, man. And I was just a mess, I was a mess. So this is seven years ago. Yes. So what happens next? Do you go, was that the first thing? You quit the job and then you go back to Columbia? Yes. And you assemble like the, the, the Marvel cast of yes. Crusaders to come with you yeah. and like. I have, I have just enough money to do those two up. And the, and the, there's so one. you're funding it yourself. Yes, yeah. So I'm like calling a lawyer. You like, gotta buy guns, you gotta buy whatever yeah. materials, you gotta. Or we gotta buy everything we need to get. Yeah, and I'm, I'm calling a lawyer. I'm like, how do I make a nonprofit? Like, I, I guess that's the best way to do this. I had no idea what I was doing, right? Like, well, we'll set you up. And I got some people to donate, and we we just went in. And we had the two cases, the, the one in Haiti, which is the other powerful story, uh-huh. and Columbia. They were both kind of the reasons I, I left. Yeah, yeah. And so I didn't have enough money to go home, so I would just jump, I would bounce back between Haiti and Columbia until we had success, and we did in both. It was both of them were crazy cases, and we ended up rescuing over 120. No way. Yeah. So what happens after you? You guys go in, you get the bad guys, you know, you break up the operation, and then there's 100 kids. What happens to those 100 kids next for the next 10 years? Right, so that's the most important part. That's the most important question. And then that's the question we've asked first. Before we'll engage with law enforcement partners, first of all, we always work with law enforcement. We're not real. Local government. The local government law enforcement. We say, here's our services. In this case, it was easy, because as an agent, I was already working with them. Uh-huh. I had to leave, and then I said, I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> I lost my badge and my life, maybe, but, but I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> but I brought the resources and, and the, a coalition of the willing, you know, former law enforcement folks who were willing to just jump on in this operation. Yeah. And, um, and then we, but we said, we can't do anything until we know where, what happens to the kids. And so what we do is we have an aftercare department, which is our most important department, which partners with the local uh, non-government organizations that are aftercare centers. And they exist in every country. Mm. And so we partner with them and we say, look, we mm. could rescue up to this many kids. How many could you take? And, and take means raise. Yeah. Because you, you don't know fund house for feed, until they until they go to university, you know. Mm-hmm. Because uh, it's so many times, more than half the time, I'd say there's not a family waiting for them with open arms. They there is no family, which is how they got taken in the first place, or the family's part of the problem because they're they're, they're selling, getting paid, they're, they're getting, getting paid. the money, yeah. yeah. And so we set up with those partnerships so that when the kids are rescued, we know exactly. In fact, the aftercare partners are with us when the raid happens and they write to the kids, you're safe, you're, you're not bad guys, because the kids think, am I getting arrested or what's going on? You know? So we set it up to where the, the aftercare team is immediately on the ground and the healing process begins. And they'll either second. get potentially adopted by another family or they'll be in a right. facility, a home or some yes, type of facility. Yes, exactly or, right. 
Now, what about, you mentioned that it sounds like half the time the parents are involved in selling their kids, especially, I've heard about this in Asia, like a lot of their, it's like a form of love to like say, how much money can you bring back to me type of thing. Oh, I don't know yeah. if I'm off there, but yeah. how do parents, what's the psychology behind that for parents where they feel like it's not a bad thing? I've heard of this sometimes, some cases. It's like part of the culture, I guess. Now, how do you, as a parent, how could you do that? Like, it's, how, it's, that how do you get to that point? So you're exactly right with how you're describing it. That is how it is. And it's something I cannot comprehend. It's, it's almost like they're so desperate for, for means, so for poor. money. They're so poor. Yeah. And they're just like, well, they, I think they just have to compartmentalize and just kind of normalize sexual activity, even if oh, it's your 12-year-old daughter. Like you just got to. This is what we. This is what we have to do. You know. <clears throat> Oftentimes it's cyclical, it's generational. Yeah. So it's like they were. That's what saved. I had to do. Yeah. So that's what you have to do, and we've got to break it. And and that's been part of the problem because when it's culturally accepted, sometimes the laws reflect that as well. And so there's a lot of countries where we've gone and helped them establish their laws mm. where they didn't exist before. And oftentimes I'd say the majority of the first cases we do, the first investigations we do in a given country, is their first investigation into this. As well, so that's so we provide the tools. We 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 build digital forensic laboratories, for example. We built wow. one in, in Southeast Asia that services four or five countries there, and give them the tools they've never had before to go into the dark net, to go and find where, you know, track IPs where ch child pornography is being distributed. Yeah, it's 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 a nutty thing. So, is U.S. the biggest consumers of? Sex trafficking, then? It's We're the biggest consumers of child exploitation material. So, pornography. Yeah, child, 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 child pornography. sex pornography. Yep. We're the, We're the biggest, biggest consumers, consumers in the world. And, and one of the biggest producers as well of it. Really? Yeah, so the, the, we are the demand. Oh my gosh. This is why we have success overseas. Why are we so messed up? I think it has to do with, first of all, it's, it's the internet. It's access to the internet. It's, it's, it's the technology that's readily accessible here that we can use the peer-to-peer -peer networks, dark net kind of stuff where we can learn how to use that quick. It's, it's, it's software, you, and then all of a sudden you're in. And so it takes a degree of technology. And then we have a large population with lots of technology. I don't think per, per capita it's like a whole lot worse here. Yeah. It's just that we have the numbers and the technology, the technology. and that together creates. It's an easier access. It's easier access, yeah. So people become sex addicts easier in this country in mass so than in other there's, countries. There's sex addicts all over the world. We just have easier access to exploiting that thing. And we have 300 million people that are all, that all have that access. So that, that creates a lot of demand in this country. How easy is it to watch child, I've never seen child pornography. Yeah. I don't even know how easy that so, would be. How easy, if I wanted to go on the internet right now. Way too easy. How long would it take for me? Is it 30 minutes? Is it Less. five minutes? If you, have, like, if you have some skill, like, it's, it's not, Can you just type in child pornography? No, you're not going to Google it. No. Okay. And, and no one tried that, by the way. The, yeah, the cops they'll track lacking. you. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not that easy. Like, it's just like a Google search. But there's ways, if you understand the dark net and how, and how different networks I don't even work. Know, I don't even know what the dark net is, but yeah. I mean, that's crazy. So if you can get into that, then you could find it quickly. Oh, it's, it's, and if you have, and it's, are they updating new stuff all the time? Is oh, like, yeah. There, in the last three or four years, there's been a 5,000% increase in new Child content. Content. It's growing like is it, mad. I mean, is, are they doing it because they're making money? Are people having to pay for it? Is it free? Like, how do they? Oh no, they they make they make money. It's by it's, selling it. They sell it. Yeah. You purchase Gosh, access to certain no places way. and like a membership. Yeah, and no then you way, end up traveling. Man. You know, you can then you get into that world. You get into the networks, and you and now you're traveling to engage in in, in become, become a sex. contact offender. That we call a contact offender, where you're now having sex. Having sex. Yeah. A contact. Offender. A contact offender. Contact offender. Yeah. So, man, this is a whole other world. I'm so, sorry. I know I'm bringing darkness to this beautiful show. No, it's I'm okay. Sorry. I think I think it's all, <laughs> important to educate people on how to live a better life and how to how to you know constantly be educating ourselves on all these different challenges. Well, we have to because the problem is, considering the fact that we are the number one demand and can, and, and we are number three for uh, destination countries, that means that the pedophiles are here, and our kids are here. They're, they're mixed and mingled amongst this group, so parents need to wake up and understand the apps that their kids are using. We had a guy just 30 minutes from my home just a few weeks ago who was gaming um, with two six-year-old girls from Indiana. Six years old. This guy's 42 years old. Like on Twitch or something or like just, on some platform? Well, it started on Facebook. These kids were on Facebook, and then it went. Most games today have the, the ability to, you, you know, you can play with other people other social media from platforms. across the earth. And it's fun, it's cool. But parents who didn't grow up with 
this mentality and this yeah. of technology, they think their kids are playing the computer because when I was a kid, it was Atari. Yeah. <laughs> and you're, you're playing the computer. Yeah, you're not playing other people. Right. Live. So parents don't even think like, oh, she's playing that cute little game. She's fine. She's been playing for six months with a pedophile no way. from Salt Lake City. And the guy got the kids, the six-year-old girls, two of them, to undress and take no. naked pictures. How? I'm not kidding. He just said, just desensitize them. They can read or he can talk to them and, you know, and just like, take your clothes off. Put the camera no down. No way. Yes. And, and the AG's office picked the guy up and arrested him. Really? But this is happening in mass, especially right now. We've never seen it like we have right now because the kids are out of school. Kids are out of school and people are in their homes all and day. And pedophiles are out of work. And, and we, can chart, we can track their chatter on the dark net and they're communicating and they keep saying, it's harvest time, these kids are sitting ducks. No, they're not. Yeah. They're not saying this. They are. How many? Six million, up, up to six million additional reports from the National Center in Mission, for, for Mission Exploited Children than the same time last year. And we won't even know the ramifications. It'll take years before these, some of these victims come up because these guys are, the lines are out in the water right now. Oh my god. We take for granted the infrastructure of schools and after school programs and sports programs, we take for granted how safe that makes our kids from these online predators because that's where they are. They're online. So it's easier to fish now is what oh, you're saying. Oh yeah, because the mom and dad are worried about their jobs. They're scavenging for food. The kids, hey, they're, they're told, take the smartphone, take the laptop, right. stay here, play games, do your schoolwork. We got to go figure it's out. It's almost less safe to be on a tablet than it is to be at an after school program. 100% less safe to be I mean, home. You, know, you, hear, you hear stories about, uh, is it Larry Nassar, I think the... Uh, yeah. The, the gymnastics, the US doctor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, you felt like your kids were safe at a, yeah. a US sanctioned right. training program, but this happened to You're, hundreds of girls, but right. it's less safe. Right, you online. can it's a great point. Some people say, Well, I, I get worried about after school programs. This this is, and, and this is a credible doctor who's like right. creating and, educational and that, videos. And that happens as well. Yeah. But this, in terms of the sheer numbers, is way more threatening. Because there's millions it's, of pedophiles. It's easier to do it. There's millions of kids. They know the parents aren't paying attention because they're worried about right. their, 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 their livelihood. Yeah. And they just access the kids and they start gaming with them. They start, they befriend them on, you know, on Facebook or whatever. And all of a sudden it's, it's on and it's horrible. What are two or three things that parents can do now that they have this information to protect their kids against any type of sex offenders? So the most important thing is understand the apps your kids are on. Understand the social media platforms your kids are on know if people can access them pretty readily, pretty quickly. And, and that's the problem is parents just, if you're, if you're my age or older, we missed it. We missed right. the internet. So right. we, didn't, we didn't grow up understanding with raging hormones and, and undeveloped brains. We didn't have to deal with the internet too. Our kids do. And so parents just don't know there's an education. What are the most care. challenging apps they should be aware of? Or is it all social media? It's is all social media, anywhere where you can connect with, with bad guys. Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, right. Instagram, it right. doesn't matter. The parents of those six-year-old girls I told you about, they said, we had no idea. We thought the kids were just playing the computer. Wow. No, no, they were playing a pedophile and the little kid game, whatever it was. And so parents, that's the number one thing. Know what your kids are doing. Understand the applications. If you need help, you can go to your internet service provider and say, hey, can you send me a record of every, you own that phone that you give your kid, right? Right, right. They can give you a record of every site that's hit, every game that's played. Conversations, yeah, yeah. Right, every conversation. What, what's the conversation that a parent should have with their kids, whether they're five or 15, to at least educate them a little bit without scaring them? You know, but what can a parent say, whether they know something's happening or not, to prepare them for this? So it's a great question, and for me, having nine kids, you have to really meditate and pray and focus on each individual kid and, and customize that answer. Because wow. if, you, if you come in too early, you could hurt them. It's a tough subject, you know, but if you, if you miss, if you come in too late, you could also hurt them. So when they start asking questions and when you kind of feel your intuition, luckily I have my wife who I can say, when, when is it time for this yeah. one? It's, it's, it's now. Okay, let's have the talk. And then what you say also is customized you know, to, to what you think they're ready for. Mm -hmm. But you have to be in front of it. Whatever that answer is, that's the key. Is being, have a close relationship with your kid. Be their friend and their parent and, understand, and connect with their soul so that you can get that inspiration. Okay, now's the time and here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, too often we say nothing because we don't want to talk about sex and, and you know, it's, it opens that whole door, or birds and the bees, and parents just ignore right, it. That's right, the right, worst right. thing you can right. do. Because then someone else is going to teach them and they're going to get hurt. So it's just it's just tuning into that kid. Wow, that's but, the that's the responsibility you have as a as a parent to, yeah. be, a, to be a leader and to have hard conversations. Yeah. And I'm not a parent yet, so I 
I don't look forward to it, but I also know that I'm going to rise to the occasion <laughs> yeah. and be able to have the courage to be able to, to have those hard conversations. How do you categorize a pedophile and how many of them are there in the USA? Well, like what's the definition? Someone, someone who, who actively sex, seeks sexual interaction with a child. In person contact, or, not. Yeah. No, there's still a pedophile. It could be, you could not have become a contact offender quite yet, but they all want to become. It's, it's like someone who looks at porn, right? An adult who's looking mm -hmm. at porn. I don't think anyone looks at porn with, with that being the end, right? Right, right, right. They want to take action eventually. And that's, that's how child pornographers are as well. They're eventually looking to take action and take, become a contact offender. That's crazy. Yeah, so, so how many are there? So in? there's, we know, I couldn't give you the exact number, but we do know this. There's, the fact that there's 2 million children in sex slavery, consider what kind of number justifies probably, that probably, demand. It's probably 50x, right? <laughs> exactly. If, it's like any other market. If like, a percentage is going to take if action. If they need 2 million kids, that means you're going to have a market of 2 million US or 2 million That's world, global, worldwide. global, yeah. Yeah, and, but the US number keeps rising. There's a couple hundred thousand, we in estimate US. children. Wow. But that number, there's about, there's about 18,000 women and children a year who are smuggled in to the United States for the purposes of, of, of being exploited. As, as, as and slaves. And is this uh, a financial transaction, 300,000 kids, or is this sexual abuse? Um, Again, there's, there's, like from adults to a kid. You yeah, know. there's a mix. There's a mix yeah, of, of, yeah. Of, of both of those. I mean, for me, I, you know, I was sexually abused when I was five by a man that I didn't know. You're a, kidding me. No, I didn't I'm know not. This. Yeah, and the babysitter's son, he was probably 16 or 17, I was five. It's one of my probably first three or four memories I've ever oh had. Oh my gosh. For 25 years, I didn't tell anyone. and. It, deeply shaped my life. The, it only happened once. I can't even imagine something happening over and over again and not feeling comfortable or safe. And it deeply impacted the way I think, the way I yeah. took action, how I was defensive and, and like everyone, I felt like everyone was out to get me. It was like everyone's yes. trying to abuse me, everyone's trying to take advantage of yes. me. And it showed up in every area of my life from sports to teachers to relationships to yeah. business partners until six and a half, seven years ago, I finally opened up and started to heal and started talking about it for the first time. For 25 years, no one knew about this. Wow. And it was one of the hardest things I ever did was talking about it. And then I knew that this had power over me because I, I was so afraid of what would happen if people knew this about me. The more I talked about it with family, then friends, then I finally opened up publicly about it on my show and the, the moment when it was no longer like scary to talk about it, when it's when I realized like, okay, now my healing is starting. Yeah. And it's been an amazing six and a half year journey of healing the past, letting go, forgiving, obviously not forgetting, it's always gonna be with me, the memory, but the ability to have peace in my heart and move on and see what can I do moving forward to make sure that other people aren't sexually abused. No, yeah, what so you're doing a, is so important because yeah. this is the, the problem is people, to heal, they've gotta come. It's, They've got to start talking about it. You have it, to right? talk about it. Yeah. It's the only way you can really heal is to start sharing with someone, whether it's a, yeah. a, a spiritual pastor, or a, a therapist, right. a parent that you trust, a friend you trust. But when you hold on to this secret and you don't tell anyone, you're going to suffer. Right. Now imagine, Lewis, that's happened once, right? Yeah, to you. one time. Imagine so it happening every day, every week. Yeah, imagine. So I was with a neurologist once because I had to understand huh. that what's going on with these kids. And he says, Tim, let me show you something. He showed me two brains, on scans of brains. Two children's brains, and he said, "Do you see what I'm? Do you see the scarring in the? Yeah, what's going on?" He said, "One of these brains was a traumatic car accident. This other one was a child who, for five years, was sexually abused." And I was like, "Wait, what?" Very similar. The, so that's what I mean. It creates actual physiological scarring no, yeah. in your brain. Absolutely. And and this is the problem. So the rehab part, the, the chronic re stress, the chronic fear, all the, these different things. Yes, it, come it up, actually yeah. creates physical brain yeah. damage. Yeah. That requires physical healing of yeah. that brain. Which, Emotional healing, physical, right, spiritual it's, healing. It is. It's a, and when I saw that, I can't tell you how motivated I was to get back out and just wow. start nailing these guys because this is. I mean, there's there's nothing worse in my mind in, in earth or hell than this. Yeah. Uh, most of these kids would rather that they were killed than go through this, you know? Our, our sentencing so far, I don't think, really reflects the the real damage that's being done. And it's because people don't want to talk about it, right? We gotta, the more we talk about it, the better our justice system will be, the more the better our aftercare services will be. But this is a very real 
very, very real threat to, to all our kids. And how's the process work for you, if you can break it down for me? How do you decide who you're gonna go after? Is it, okay, we're assessing the dark web information first, we have researchers on your team that are finding this person's got 50 kids, this has got 20, you know, how do you guys assess like where you're gonna go make the hit? So when I first left the government, I had un, I had basically pending cases, right, that I couldn't work because they were outside my jurisdiction. So those first ones, like the one in Colombia and Haiti, yeah. those were easy. The but then after yeah. that, it was like, now it, where do we find the next? So one? it's funny. It's funny. Great question because I start. I'm like knocking on doors, like, can I work? Can I help you guys? Yeah. Because those two hits were successful, so we got more donation dollars. So I'm like, oh, wow. and I had, I had to actually convince people, like, you have a problem, we can help. We were turned down. Seven years later, turned down by what? Governments, countries, by governments, by law enforcement. Like we don't need your help. We're right. we're fine here. We don't think there's a problem. You know, uh, today, seven years later, we are saying no. Like we can't keep we can't keep up. Everybody's asking us, hey, so and so told us you did X, Y, and Z in their country. Can you help us with this piece? Can you help us with that? And so now what we have to do is is we have to find the law enforcement units around the world. We're in 26 countries, the ones that are that can sustain our tools. So if we give them something and give them training, that it's a, it's a scalable solution they have, you know, so it's not just us doing the work and then leaving. So that's how we kind of judge it right now. We wish we could be everywhere, but we have to go to where they're most right. prepared right. to make the biggest difference, the biggest impact. Of course. So. And what are, the, what are the top three countries right now that have the most cases and the, and the biggest problem? I, I, think, I think Southeast Asia. Really? Is, oh, that whole region is just, just, bad, huh? just so sad and so, so terrible. But the, but the law enforcement is doing amazing work and we're working really closely with them. That's, that's where we put our first digital forensic lab. And so uh, now they're going in and routing out the, the, this the, is crazy, the bad man. guys in there. And it's 50% yeah. locals and it's 50% kind of US based who's coming in and, and committing the crimes. Yeah, lots of, lots of sex tourists. The, the locals are. How big are of always, an industry is the sex tourist industry? How much? How much money? Okay, well, human. So human trafficking. Yeah. Altogether, is one hundred and fifty billion dollars no a way. year. No way. One hundred and fifty billion. And so to put that into perspective. How much is the sex uh, tourism in human trafficking? Um, it's the, that's about uh, thirty-five billion. I believe. Wow. Yeah. Just the sex alone is thirty-five billion. The the, the contact the the sex the physical sex not the digital. Uh, consumption of media, right? Yeah, thirty-five billion dollars in the selling of people for sex. Contact Gosh, for thirty-five billion. If you can imagine that number, I mean, the, and then you, you bring in the slave labor, and that, that's what gets it up to one hundred fifty billion. Human trafficking in general. Human trafficking yes. in general. And to give some perspective, because that number is so big, with the, with the amount of money made buying and selling people every year, you could buy every Starbucks franchise in the world, you could buy every NBA team, and still have enough money left over to send every U.S child to college for four years. That's how much money is spent in modern day slavery every year. That's why I say this isn't a peripheral thing, right? even though we act like it is because we don't want to address it, we don't want to engage it, it hurts. Why do we not want to address it? It's it hurts, you know, it's just, it's, I, I know why, because I didn't want to address it. I ran, I tried to, I tried to quit many times. Okay? Really? And my wife always turned me around and said, you can't, sweetie. Oh my gosh. You know, um, because here's what happens, and this is what happened to me is you see children being hurt and you can't help it. You superimpose your own children's faces mm. on those children and then you just can't bear it, right? You just can't handle it. I mean, I, I had to go to psychotherapy to not do that. The mandatory, they sent us every year to get checked out. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I kept, I'd go every year and think, okay, this is my year that I'm gonna, get they're, out. Gonna, they're gonna boot me out because I know I'm crazy. And like, oh, you passed Mr. Bell, congratulations. What? <laughs> Save me. Because <laughs> I, I thought I was crazy. No, you're fine, okay. Um, wow. but, but one of the things, that was the hardest thing for me to kick is learn how to not see my own child's face so I could deal with it. Later on, about, about, 10, about 15 years later into this, I changed my tune and I allowed myself to see my kids' faces and that made all the difference because all of a sudden now I'm, I'm pushing the envelope. It's more, you're more connected to and it. What happened was I, I came across a situation a few years back where we were, we were going into a, a child trafficking center and there was 28 little children that were being sold. Little meaning under 12? Oh, from 1 to 12. Gosh. For sex. For sex. And so I'm walking in there. They think I'm a customer. And I'm walking in and I see all these kids. Like a storefront? It, it, was, it, was, an, it was an orphanage front. It, they were claiming to be an orphanage. No way. Yeah, this was in Haiti. They were claiming to be an orphanage. But all the kids were mostly kids they collected after the hurricanes or earthquakes. They, the parents die and they say, oh, come to our orphanage. Oh well, it's not gosh. an orphanage. So we, we were actually tracking a missing child that we knew had been there. And so that's what got us in there. 
And when I saw the kids outside the gate, I was about to go in, the same, it was almost like a PTSD reaction where I'm like, oh, I see, I'm seeing my kids, okay, do the training they taught you. But instead I said, you know what? What if I don't do that this time? What if I let it happen? Mm. What if I just allow my, these kids to be my kids? So I went in there and I was like, oh my gosh, I never should have done that technique. I should have always done this. Mm. And this is why I encouraged before everyone. Before you were wearing like a mask. Right. So you wouldn't feel it as because deeply, but now you're feeling it so deeply. So deeply. And what wouldn't you do for your own child? Oh, wow. So now I'm willing to go the distance, right? And that case got nuts. And it's funny, I, I know this experiment led to this. We, when, after we rescued, we rescued 28 kids, we did the whole sting by, and I ended up adopting two of the kids no that we way. rescued, who are now my kids. In Haiti. Yeah. It was a preventative strike. Turns out none of it have actually been sold yet. They're all being sold. And so, yeah, so two of my kids now, they came from that operation. Wow. So they literally, it, like literally they made became it. became your kids. They became yeah. my kids, yeah. Wow. How many kids do you have now? I have nine now. Wow. <laughs> seven <laughs> from birth of your Seven, own. seven, yeah, biological. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, two and adopted. And then two adopted, yep. How many more? I mean, how many do you want to have? Oh man, we were st I, the prenup said six. Okay, when, when we got married, <laughs> really? yeah, we were done at six, and and we were both done. We're like, we can't. We got the six. I came from six. My wife came from six. Yeah. And then this case happened after that, and we saw these kids, and it was just like, here's my wife again. I, I call her and said, you won't believe this. What I just saw these two little kids. It was the two kids I actually bought in the sting operation. I mean, I just like, grew attached to them, and it was my wife who just had this experience, and she just said, I want to be their mom. Wow. I said, No, you don't. You can't do this. Like we can't do this. You know, I want to be their mom. So that's how that's how it started, and we ended up bringing them home. And then the seventh one came, de defying all science. Somehow, it happened. somehow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so how how much does it cost to buy a kid? I mean, to buy a kid, is it to buy them to own them? Is to it own to buy them. them to have sex? What's the difference between? You can, they do both. Okay, so generally, if, if you're gonna take a kid, if you're gonna if you're gonna use a kid for for the weekend or something, you can probably double or triple the price of what the 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 the, the, in a, the adult sex market would be. Oh so if you, whatever a prostitute, you know, sex worker, whatever you want to call it, you can uh, double or triple it. Double or triple kid. for for a child for a night or for a weekend. Or mm -hmm. whatever. For purchasing, it depends oh what the country. But those 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 kids they sold me that became mine yep. were fifteen thousand each. Um, but the work we doing thousand for a person's life. Yeah, unbelievable. Just say here, it's yours. In the Middle East, where we we're dealing with ISIS, and we're working, in, and this is where we're getting organ harvesting, and a pediatric heart is, is up to a quarter million dollars. So, th so that's a, a kid's heart. A kid's heart. That's how much. That's how much it sells in the black market. How often is this happening with organ harvesting? In the, in the Middle East, quite a bit. So ISIS rolls in in 2015, and they make sex slaves out of the Yazidi people. These these beautiful people that are just peaceful. They're living in northern Iraq and a little bit in Syria as well. And ISIS came in and just said, you are less than human, and they just took him and made sex slave markets out of them. Also, a lot of the Christian communities were, were devastated in a similar way. Uh, eventually, ISIS gets pushed off its sovereign territory and was making its money by taking over, taking over cities wow. and like taxing people. So they lost their oil revenues when they got pushed off the land, but they kept the kids. And so like, well, I gotta make money. So they start selling these kids to sex slavery or to organ harvesting. Oh my gosh. We've taken down two organ harvesting rings in, already so far. So we, this is- Do they this, keep the kids alive after they uh, take out some of their organs or is it, you're dead? Obviously with the Obviously heart, it depends, but, yeah. And not if, 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 it's a, if it's a kidney or something. They just take it yeah. out and then, okay, see you later. Yeah. You can, there's, people are finally reporting on it. I think CBS or ABC News recently did a story on it. But we're in the middle of it. This is the Nazarene Fund. I'm the CEO of also the Nazarene Fund, which mm -hmm. is a sister organization with yes. OUR. Uh, Mercury One, Glenn Beck started that. Oh, wow. And then I took it over oh, really? three, three years yeah. ago. Yeah. But yeah, Glenn no, Beck's still the founder. Guy, yeah. yeah, no, he, he was the godfather of OUR as well. He, he gave us all our first money. Glenn to, did. To, to, that, the money I needed to rescue those kids in Columbia in Haiti, that was Glenn. Really? He was the only one, he was the only one that took the chance. He's like, I'll, wow. I'll front it, go for it. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. He got, oh. he got me the money, it was pretty intense. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, risked his whole, his whole media company. Wow, really. yeah. His lawyer said, don't do it. You, if they fail or someone gets hurt, you're screwed. He's, wow. like, he's like, I don't care. He's like, I'm not gonna go to my maker and wow. tell him I said no. It was an amazing story. Um, so yeah, so he, 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 he asked me to run the Nazarene Fund three years ago. So that's our work in the Middle East, which is just this stuff with, and we're extracting these kids. I mean, we're going in and taking the kids out. So have you found kids who've had 
uh, you know, I guess organs taken out or. Oh yeah, no, there's and they're the ones really? that are surviving. Kidneys yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. So you find them and they got they're sewn up or whatever. And yeah, you can, and, and there's that's there's there's been like I said, there's some mainstream media have gotten into it. Thank goodness in the, in the last several months, and you can see that you, people can go on Google and you can see it. They're stitched up. They're, but but, but if you're a, if you're a small child, they're gonna make their most money off a pediatric heart. Really, they're quarter million dollars off a heart. They're, they're very high in demand. Yeah. Man, this is crazy, man. Yeah, servicing markets generally outside the United States, right? Like these are markets in countries yeah, that yeah, there's, yeah. The there's no regulations and there's this is crazy, it's just man. black market stuff. The work you're doing is really amazing. And you've got a movie coming out, which I got to see a trailer of it a couple months ago. Yeah. And when's the date it's coming out? Do we know it? We're, we don't know. Later, later yeah, in the year. Co COVID probably. shifted everything, so yeah. we don't really know. But the film is locked. It's done. It stars Jim Caviezel, Mary Servino, Bill Camp. It's um, going to be amazing. It's it's these guys were these guys are, are artists they're geniuses it's they did a very good job and what's the movie called and what's it what's it telling the story of it's called the sound of freedom and it, it, it basically tells the story I just a lot of that I just told you yeah um like for example with the little boy in the van they actually filmed that scene exactly where it happened with the necklace and all oh my that goodness. and it, and it gets into Columbia the the Columbia raid where we rescued the, the 120 our first big operation that rescued 121 yeah and what's your what's your mission moving forward with uh, the movie with just everything you're up to is it to end uh, sex slavery? Is it to it is rescue to, a certain amount of kids a it year? It is to what? end it. Yeah. So we, we did an experiment. We and and it was very telling in 2014. We we put all, almost all of our resources into the nord, northern region of Colombia. One region. One region, and we just said just pounded. How do we pounded, get rid of it? Pounded, yeah. pounded, like every month, two or three operations, and empowered the law enforcement, and then to the point where they stopped. And the would-be traffickers said, yeah, I had to give it up. I'm, I'm into drugs and I'm doing something. This is crazy. Yeah. And so we, we did it. We knew it would happen. It's logical. Like, now there's a consequence. There wasn't before. But we did it to show, like, if everybody would, would, would focus, focus, focus on child crimes, we, if we all did it together, we could, we could end it. But it's not going to be governments alone. It's going to be people getting loud, mm -hmm. which is we have an opportunity right now because people are getting loud about it yeah. for the first time in a long time. Or maybe ever on July 30th, which is yep. this anti-human trafficking, um, you know, world anti-awareness day, day. Yeah, yeah. So how can how can my listeners get involved? Uh, whether a small way or they want to get involved in a bigger way, what can they do? Can they go to your website? Can they people, email you? Can yeah, they people can go to our website, message? OURrescue.org. Um, OURrescue.org is the website. Um, look at our videos, and there's a, there's something on there that says join the fight. And we have all sorts of ideas people can do to get involved. Mm -hmm. So I told you about that dog tag, right? Yeah. The dog tag that becomes my commission, right? It's yeah. with my name on it and it changed my life. And a lot of people have said, I want one of those. I want my commission. So um, Love Grenade is a company that has made replicas of that very necklace. Okay. And people can get it, and that can become their commission, and they can wear it and remember the kids. And so there's a link here, I believe, on your we'll on put your, it on in the show, show notes. Yeah, yeah, for so people, sure. People and, and the money goes towards rescuing kids. People can also uh, text help them to five one five five five, and we're giving specific instructions on how you can mm -hmm. get involved in your city on July thirtieth. Mm -hmm. Sixty cities have already committed to to get loud in some way. They'll go to a park, you know, obey the, the laws and the social mm -hmm. distancing. But that's a generally go to a park, and local leaders will show up and commit that we're gonna do more for kids and wow. make sure the kids in your community are protected. Wow, yeah. it's exciting. And yeah. if you wanna be a part of helping spread the message, make sure to share this video out or share this audio out and uh, make sure to follow Tim. What are you on social media? Tim Ballard 89. Tim Ballard 89, make sure to follow Tim, make sure to tag him when you're sharing this out so he can follow up with you as well and stay connected. Um, I know you do a lot of other stuff behind the scenes that I want to get into hopefully soon at, in Utah and be a part of learning about how you guys Oh yeah, we're bringing you this. up, man. We're, we're going to put you into one yeah. of our training me in. programs. Lock me in. <laughs> um, uh, so the movie, be aware. So if you go to the website, if you sign up, you follow you, you'll be able to watch the movie when it comes out. You'll Absolutely. Be we'll keep you up to date on everything. Yeah. Else. So you've got a bunch of books to talk about this as well. If you want to dive in down the rabbit hole, you can read Yeah, i got lots of content for you if you want to learn more. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but this is an amazing mission that you're on for me who's been... You know, I wasn't sold, but I dealt with sexual abuse, and I know the trauma that it has in the years of unwiring that it takes yeah. to feel normal, to feel like the world isn't out to get you, to yeah. feel like your stress levels go down, to feel like I couldn't go to sleep at night. It took yeah. me hours to go to sleep every night yeah. until I was about 30. Oh my and then gosh. when I started to heal, I could finally sleep. Yeah. 
So I know what it does to the wiring of a human being with sexual abuse. That's right. I can't even imagine what it would do to someone who's being sold by their parent, not by their parent, over and over and over again for years. I couldn't even imagine how you would start to heal. So what you're doing is an amazing uh, gift and a service to humanity, and I really acknowledge you for that, Tim, for for being an incredible leader in this space, being a hero in this space, and using your wisdom, your skills, your tools, your resources, your relationships to make the biggest impact in this space. And I wanna be a support for as long as I can on this. This is a big part of me that I wanna help out as well. I wanna ask you a final uh, final few questions. This is um, called The Three Truths. So I wanna imagine it's your last day on Earth. Okay. And you go somewhere else after your body dies, right? Okay, yeah. But you've accomplished every dream you could think of in your whole life, for your personal life, for your family, your kids, for your businesses, for your foundation. Anything you can imagine, it's come true. But for whatever reason, all of your work has to go with you. Your videos, movies, content, it's gotta go with you to the next place. Mm. But you get to leave behind three lessons you know to be true. You get to write it down on a piece of paper and this is all we would have to remember you by, are these three lessons, or what I like to call three truths. What would you share with the world that are your three truths? I think the first truth, the most important truth, and this comes from years of trying to find light in my darkness. Because mm-hmm. to work in this world is so dark and it will dest- destroy you, it will destroy you. <clears throat> I needed to find light. And so my, my advice to people would be, or, or you know, the, w- what I would share is, because we all have darkness, I don't care who you are, you don't need to be fighting trafficking, right? Darkness is everywhere. Yeah. So I would, my, mine would be based on how to get light in your darkness and the number one thing is serving other people. Mm-hmm. Service turns the lights on. Tony Robbins taught me this. I mean, I, I, I knew it just functionally, but until he put the words to it in the research. I mean, when you, when you serve people, something happens game. to your brain. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a physiological, in my mind, it's, it's God. I'm mm-hmm. a faith guy. And, and, and um, when, you, um, when you serve people, your, your brain literally releases serotonin and, and, and endorphins and, and um, oxytocin. Yep. And, and uh, what it does is people that have an excess of those beautiful... You feel better. You, you feel could, better. Yeah, you're healthier, and you're you have, happier. You have more courage. You have more yeah. optimism. You have, this is science, yeah. right? Now, in my mind, what that is, is it's also, I, I believe it's God preparing your body to commune. Mm-hmm. And, and with the God, your creator, whatever it is, I don't care. But the, a higher source that will then give you that you need yeah. to, to be a better version of yourself. Yeah. Okay. And so service has all these benefits apart from just doing the good of helping somebody. Mm-hmm. It's this amazing thing that turns the lights on in so many ways. Yeah. So service, number one, to other people. Number two is kind of related to it, but it's, it's that communion part. It's, it's, it's prayer, meditation, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, but connecting to that, that greater being, whatever that is, and, 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 and getting that, that positive energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it just makes, if you're a better version of yourself, you are a blessing to other people, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not a selfish thing. It's it's actually a selfless thing. Yeah. Get yourself good, because yeah. then you're good for others, you know. And so number two, I'd say that is that that meditation, that communion. Mm-hmm. And number and three. And the number three is find at least one person that you really love and that really loves you back. There's a lot of relationships, you know, where you don't you don't have time or there's the ability to connect that way. But for me, it's my wife. But find that person, because I've, I mean, I've told you many stories. And you have to, the the coolest stories I told you was actually me running away and my wife turning me back around. Mm. Thank good, I, we, this n- none of this would happen. I wouldn't be sitting here with you if she hadn't turned me around when I ran for cover yeah. <laughs> throughout my life, throughout my career. And and I credit that relationship. Wow. With with, with, what, with what's the thing you love about Catherine the most, your wife? She does the right thing no matter what, and 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 it doesn't matter. The consequences, mm. I mean, she literally said to me, if we end up on a beach in a tent and that's where we're living because we did this, I don't care. Wow. We have to do the right thing by these children and by God, and the right thing is to quit every, and, and leave everything. I mean, I calculated, it was millions of dollars in pension, and I had a whole, right. I had a whole charted out, my life was charted <laughs> right, out. Right. I'm like, Catherine, we're watching, like, it doesn't matter. These are real children. And there's, and there's consequences for Yeah, and if for, you say one, it's worth it in her mind. Right, how is it not worth it? And just how quick she gets to that. Mm. Like, this is wrong, this is right, we're gonna do the right thing. Okay, 
like that she just she has that kind of it's it's a it's intuition it's inspiration a conscience i don't know what you call oh, it yeah. but she she has it and and i know i can go to her and say i don't know what to do what do i do and she's going to be right you know and if she doesn't know she'll tell me i don't i don't know let's figure this yeah, out yeah so i think that's that's the thing i i, I love most wow. about her that's beautiful yeah Okay, um, we can find you online, Tim Bauer, 89. We'll, we'll connect you uh, and link up everything in the show notes. I've got, is there anything that you want to share that you haven't shared before my final question? Anything you wish people asked you about this or that you feel like people need to know about? You know, one thing I'll say is um, I'm worried about the world right now. I'm worried about kids right now a lot. Um, because I feel like we pursue good things and, and, and they make sense but too often we don't consider the children who are being hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's unintended, it's no one's intent to do this. But we, we, we talked about, for example, we're in the middle of a debate right now, and I'm not, this is not partisan for me, it's not political, even though everything seems to go that way these days, right? Yeah. But, but the, the, the idea of opening schools and what that re does, all I'm saying, I'm not gonna give the answer to the question, I'm not smart enough to give an answer to that question. But I will say this, that we're not listening, we're not even, cons I don't see the kids as part of the debate. For example, the spike, six million additional reports of children being abused originating online. This is from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And um, that's a lot of pain. Yeah. And it happened because we, as a society, we decided to shut everything down because of COVID. Okay, do we know the trade offs? That's all I'm asking. Do right. we, are we, are we considering the trade offs? And the concern I have is, you know, the CDC and others have come out. I'm not a scientist, but I can read data. And if you're 60 years or younger, you have a 99.9% .9 chance of surviving. If you're older, it's very, very, very dangerous and you should definitely take mass precautions and we should do everything we can to support that. But teachers who create the infrastructure that keep kids from being sexually assaulted, right. they, like 89% are under 60 years old. Mm -hmm. And so the, the real question that we should be asking is what's, what's, what's scarier to you? Mm. A virus, once we've taken care of the the most vulnerable, what's scarier, a virus with a 99.9% .9 survivability or the trade-off, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of children being sexually assaulted? We're not even having the discussion. That's mm -hmm. my concern. Mm -hmm. I'm not smart enough to come up with the yeah, actual the solution. solution. Yeah. But at least have the, the, the discussion. And, the, and it boils down to this. Kids can't get loud. They can't organize. They can't protest. They can't march. And so we don't hear from them. Mm -hmm. It's on us adults to stand up and be their voices. Yeah. And say, we will sit at the table for you. We will make sure you are represented. Wow. So that's, that's something my... Something to think about, yeah, for sure. Something to, to think about. We need to figure out a solution. Right. It's that's hard. It. These are complex things. I don't, hard. I don't have the answers, but yeah. I know kids are being hurt, and I know more can be done to make sure they're not. For sure. Absolutely. So. Well, there's always more we can do, that's for sure. Yeah. And you're doing amazing things, man. I appreciate you. I got one final question. That's what's your definition of greatness? I think, um, f for me, greatness is, is how much positive impact you can be on others. Mm. In fact, I, I, I try to make this a rule, I'm not great at this. I just, I'm a believer in it, okay? I'm not a master of it. <laughs> but when we're, when, when, when given a, a fork in the road, right? A crossroads, you gotta make a decision. And we do it every day. Do I do this or do that? I don't know what to do. Um, which one will help more people? Mm. And if you always take that road, I think that's the definition of greatness. Yeah, it's about my man. Thanks, brother. Thanks, bro. Appreciate you, man. <laughs> Thank you, man. And if you want to learn how to become happier in your life, then make sure to check out this video right here. You get such a deep sense of self-worth that you matter. And guess what? Mm -hmm. Everyone matters. Whether you matter to one people or one million people, everyone matters. Yeah. But if you see your impact on someone's life, you will feel such a deep sense of self-worth.